we can start. طيب. الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. My dear brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I would like to explain how this lecture actually came about. After I graduated from Medina University, I came back to Canada for a little bit, and I thought to myself, you know, what am I going to do with my life? And I realized that I was actually really good with social media. So I started looking for different jobs and different avenues that related to creating content for social media. And Alhamdulillah, I landed a job in Dubai. And I thought to myself, you know what, this is going to be an ideal opportunity. I get to work in a Muslim country, in a Muslim environment, and everything is going to be great. But lo and behold, I was absolutely shocked. I only lasted at my job. I would say for about three months, and eventually we mutually decided to part ways, even though I probably feel like I got fired because I just couldn't keep up with the culture that was there. So I remember the very first time they took me to a restaurant, there's like a live piano there, there's someone singing there, and I'm like, La hawla wa la quota illa billah. I thought this was like a Muslim country. And then I remember we went to another networking event. It's filled with, uh, with women. They all wanted to shake hands after each meeting and exchange business cards. And I'm refusing and it's very awkward. And eventually I ended up in a corner all by myself <laughs> with no one to talk to, no one to network with because, you know, I, I wasn't shaking hands. And other incidents like this, the company wasn't very happy and it wasn't the right fit for me. So I thought to myself, you know what, let's just mutually part ways. And I came back to Canada, uh, alhamdulillah. So with that being said, I realized for the first time the difference between what we study in the books of fiqh versus what it's like for the average Muslim when they're going to work and the challenges that they face. So I wanted to take this opportunity to discuss some of those issues in light of my experience, in light of the, the various people that I've spoken to in, in the years that have passed and hearing the challenges that they face and along with the, the knowledge that I've learned uh, and studied. So I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this uh, presentation a beneficial one. I will leave approximately five to ten minutes at the end to hear comments, feedback and to answer uh, any questions. So I would like to start off by establishing some principles first. Number one is that it's very important to understand that just because something is permissible, it's not always the best route to take. And this is why scholars when they talk about fatawa, they always say a taqwa qabl al-fatwa. That it is always better to be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and take the safer route, to take the less doubtful route and to be conscious of Allah than to ask for a particular fatwa to make something permissible. Number two, that we have to keep in mind that the general ruling in the sharia is that everything that is permissible for men is also permissible for women except in those instances that the Sharia has clearly indicated that there's a different set of rules for men and a different set of rules for women. Principle number three is that there is a recognition of that which is a dorura, which we will translate as necessity. And when there is a dorura or a necessity in the Sharia, there are two things that will be kept in mind. Number one, is a dororatu tuqaddaru biqadariha that necessities they come with concessions and those concessions will be in direct correlation to the degree of hardship that is faced so if it is a high degree of hardship there will be a high level of concession and there is a low degree of hardship then there will be a low degree of concession number two is a dororatu tubihu al mahdhurat and what that means is that in times of necessity even the impermissible will become permissible. So the clear example that you always hear, you're in an isolated environment somewhere like a desert, you're on the verge of dying, you don't find anything to eat or drink except for, you know, pig or alcohol. So in that situation, consumption of those things becomes permissible, but to the degree of staying alive. And this is how we understand both principles of durura combined. So you can eat the pig, you can drink the alcohol, but only to the degree of survival, not beyond that. It doesn't mean you fill your stomach and quench your thirst, but you ha can have enough to survive. So this shows that the impermissible becomes permissible, and also the concessions that, that come with necessities are meant to be understood in light of the degree of hardship. Number four is that the Sharia is built upon the majority cases, meaning something that happens frequently and repetition, not something that will happen once in a while and rarely. 
So sometimes some things that happen once in a while and rarely, the Sharia will not really address, but it will overlook because it is not something that happens enough. But once it starts becoming enough, it happens to a lot of people and frequently, then the Sharia will have an issue ruling, uh, ruling on it. And last but not least is the role of intention in all of these matters. And I cannot highlight this principle enough, Al-Umuru bi maqasidiha that rulings upon affairs and matters will be judged based upon the intention behind them. So you can have two people in the same situation. Both of them are going to work at the exact same company, but one individual is being rewarded for going to work and another individual is not being rewarded. The one that's being rewarded for his work, he has multiple good intentions. Number one, to earn a halal risk for his family. Number two, to be an exemplary Muslim and to give da'wah through actions and through speech. Number three is to perhaps earn money so that he can give his sadaqah and help those that are needy and poor. So these are multiple intentions that an individual can have when going to work. The more nobler intentions, the more you are rewarded. And the less you think about going to work, then the more opportunities you are missing out on in, ter in terms of earning that ajr. So this is where we will begin our discussion with the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that the best income that is earned is that which an individual earns with his own two hands, meaning that you work hard for your income. So it is better to work hard for your money and for your income than to receive something for free. People often think that, you know what, if I live off of welfare or if I live off of charity, that is perfectly fine. No, that sort of lifestyle is actually looked down upon the Sharia. In the Sharia, it is more nobler to have a difficult job where you earn a little income than to take free handouts which would give you more money. There's more nobility. The Sharia encourages nobility in that. And then number two, the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that clearly outlines and indicates the impact between the physical world and the spiritual world. The type of income that you're earning and the impact that it has on your spiritual life. And this is the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where a man is traveling through the desert with all of his belongings. And then he falls asleep and everything he has goes away. So he raises his hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Ya Rabbah, Ya Rabb, calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet wasallam comments on this man by saying that this man's eating was from haram. This man's drinking was from haram. His clothing was from haram. Then why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answer this man's dua? Meaning that the level of income or the type of income that this man had directly impacted his dua being responded to by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore making his eating haram, his drinking haram, and his clothes even haram due to the wealth that he was earning. So this shows us the importance that the Sharia pays on even the type of income that you are earning. And that will be the very first issue that we will be talking about. That when Muslims look at job opportunities, it is not just about the job that they're doing, but it is also the company that they are representing. And what that means is the company that they are working for has to have a completely halal business or the vast majority of the business needs to be halal. The vast majority of the business needs to be halal. In those situations where the vast majority of the business is haram or completely haram, then in that situation, even doing something permissible for such a company would become impermissible. So let us take an example what that looks like. So example number one we will be taking is working for a bank. And we will be speaking about the bank in general terms. So you can think about all the various jobs that are available at a bank, from being a bank teller, to being uh, an investment banker for the bank, to being a receptionist for the bank, to doing janitor work for the bank, to doing security for the bank. All of these things are possible jobs that one would have at a bank. Now if we look at the system of the bank, where is the vast majority of income of the bank coming from? The vast majority of income for this bank will be coming from loans that it gives out and from the mortgages that it gives out and accumulates interest upon these things.
that is where the vast majority of income will be earned for these banks. And that is why it will be considered an institution of oppression. So now the general rule is that if you're doing something like security or being a janitor in any place, the general ruling is that it would be permissible. However, when it becomes to an oppressive state, uh, sorry, an oppressive company like a bank where the vast majority of its income is haram, then even that job that would traditionally be considered halal ends up becoming haram in that situation, ends up becoming haram in that situation. Now, are there any situations where the job can become halal? And yes, these, the exception to this rule is if you're not working directly for the bank itself, but you're working for a company that is being hired by the bank. So for example, an individual works as a security guard and he works for a security firm. So in this situation, the bank will hire the security firm to have security on their location from time to time. And you're hired not by the bank, but you're hired by the security firm. So now even though you're doing the exact same job, in the situation that you're working for the security firm, it will become halal because the vast majority of money that the security firm will be earning will not be from the bank, but it will be from the other contracts that they have, which will be perhaps security on the roads, security at the airport, security on different facilities, the vast majority of which would be permissible. So here you get to see how the Sharia will differentiate between the same job, but based upon who are you being hired by, who you are being hired by. I would like to give you another example that is similar to this and that is doing deliveries. Especially nowadays when we have things like uh, Uber Eats and um, what are some of the other companies that deliver food? Skip the dishes, excellent. What's another one? I'm trying to think of another one. Food Dash, that's the one. All of these companies, if a Muslim was to work for these sort of companies, what is the ruling on them? So the first thing, the principle that we establish is that worldly matters are permissible until proven otherwise. Worldly matters are permissible until proven otherwise. So that is the general principle in these affairs. Then the thing we need to look at is what is the vast majority of products that these, uh, sorry, the second thing that we look at is what is the service that you're providing and that is you will be providing a driving service of delivery. You will be providing a driving service of delivery, which within of itself is permissible. Then the third thing that you look at is what exactly will you be delivering? You will be delivering different food items and different drinks and perhaps you know bread and soup and things like that, which within of itself within the Sharia is permissible until proven otherwise. And then you will look at in such situations, do you get to choose your customers and who you deliver for? Or do you not get to choose your customers and who you deliver for and you're just assigned? And that the answer to that is you do not get to choose, but rather it is imposed upon you if you choose such a job, if you choose such a job. So now the example being, had you worked for a particular company within of itself doing delivery for them, that would have a particular ruling based upon the food that they sell, whether it's halal or haram. But the fact that you're delivering deliveries and you're paid by a delivery company and not by the company that creates the haram food and sells the haram food, therefore your job would become permissible. Your job would become permissible because you're not directly hired by that company, but you're hired by Skip the Dishes or Uber Eats or any of these other companies. So regardless of what is being delivered, due to the fact that it is out of your control and you do not get to choose, then therefore it would be permissible. Therefore it would be permissible. So these are the different types of jobs that you can have in terms of income and how the Sharia would address them based upon permissibility and impermissibility. The second thing I would look at in terms of categories now is interaction with the opposite gender. Interaction with the opposite gender. So the first thing we will be looking at is the topic and concept of khalwa. And what khalwa means is to be in isolation with the opposite gender, with someone that is of desirable age, someone that is of desirable age in a closed, isolated location, in a closed, isolated location that is not easily accessible, that is not easily accessible. 
And in such situations, the Prophet ﷺ said that no man is alone with a woman except that shaitan is the third. Except with shaitan is the third. And the scholars understood from this hadith that being in isolation with a woman where you're in a confined location that is not easily accessible would be considered impermissible. Would be considered impermissible. Now, let us take a modern day understanding of this. The issue of getting into an elevator. You get into an elevator, you're by yourself. In this sort of situation, as you're in the elevator, a woman happens to come into the elevator. What does the Sharia require of you? What does the Sharia require of you? So the, what the Sharia would require of you is to look at this situation from the following lens. Number one, do you have any control in being in this situation? Yes or no? So from a theoretical standpoint, yes, you can leave the elevator and take the stairs. But what do you do in the situation? You're in a high building, let's just say 15, 20 floors. You're on the second or third floor right now. You need to get to the top. And imagine every time you're going in and out of the elevator, there happens to be a woman that comes out. Or for the sisters, if you're in that elevator and a brother comes in, what does the Sharia require in that situation? So over here, the Sharia number one looks at what is your intention in being in that elevator? Is it something halal? Is it something haram? Halal being you're just going to work, trying to do your job to the best of your ability. Haram being that you want to be in isolation with the opposite gender. You want to be in, in, the, in, the, in isolation with the opposite gender. So number one, it stays permissible. Number two, it becomes impermissible right off the bat, even before something happens, because you're intending to do haram. Number two, is that the Sharia looks at, are you in a space that is easily accessible? Yes or no? Being in an elevator, it is actually very easily accessible. And you will not control how many people come in and how many people come out. So therefore, based upon this, the Sharia would accommodate that if it is for a short period of time, and at any given time, people can come and go, this would not technically be considered khalwa. This would not technically be considered khalwa. However, the Sharia also requires that people protect their own honor. People protect their own honor. So what does that look like? Someone walks into the elevator that you feel desire towards right away. Right? It's like first glance and you feel that desire. In that sort of situation, the Sharia would encourage that you get out of the elevator to prevent anything from taking place. So if that ever happens, even though theoretically it may be permissible, you go out for the sake of protecting your desires and for the sake of protecting your honor. But in the situation where that desire will not come into play and is just a regular situation, then that situation, the decision is up to you because it remains upon permissibility. It remains upon permissibility. A second scenario that we will look at is the issue of shaking hands. Is the issue of shaking hands. And here we have multiple texts to look at. And we will look at three main texts. Number one is the ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wala taqrabu zina, that do not come close to zina. Indeed, it is something evil and lewd. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly states that. Number two, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, where she says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even when he took the bay'ah from the women, he took the pledge of allegiance from the women, he would not touch their hands, he would not shake their hands. And then number three, we have the hadith mentioned in At-Tabarani, which was authenticated by Shaykh Al-Bani rahimahullah, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is attributed to have said that it is better for a man to be stabbed in the head with an iron rod than to touch a woman that is non-mahram to him. Than to touch a woman that is non-mahram to him. So these are the proofs that we are looking at. So those scholars that said that it is impermissible in all circumstances to shake the hands of a woman that is of mari of mar what's the word marriageable marriageable maritable age that is of maritable age then it would be impermissible to shake her hand so what that means is if it's a young girl prepubescent then there's nothing wrong with shaking her hand or 
if she is elderly in age, like the age of your grandmother, and is beyond the age of childbearing naturally, then it would also be uh, permissible to hold her hand. And everything in between would become impermissible. Everything in between would become impermissible. In fact, we have both of them found in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where the young girls of Medina, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, would hold their hands. These young girls would be present. And also with the elderly women of Medina, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would physically aid them in their tasks, would physically aid them in their tasks, and thus showing permissibility. So now, the issue will arise, how about those women or the opposite gender that is of a meritable age, what happens in that situation? Over here, those scholars, when they looked at these proofs and said that, you know what, based upon these evidences, it is not permissible and in all circumstances should not be done, regardless of the consequences thereof, they have a right to hold their opinion based upon this. But is there another view? Is there another view? Yes. Let us look at what this other view looks like. What this other view looks like, it looks at the following. Let's look at the evidences they said. لا تقربوا زنا. Do not come close to zina. They said, arguing with this hadith, that yeah, uh, arguing with this ayah, that yes, while this ayah is established in the Quran, according to the culture that people live in, where shaking hands is common, people do not fall into zina or even take steps towards zina just by shaking of the hands. Just by shaking of the hands. Number two, they said the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will not take the pledge of allegiance even from the woman folk by shaking their hands or by, uh, by hand upon hand. They said that this does not indicate within of itself permissibility or impermissibility. Rather, this just shows that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would not do so. And this is a factual statement as opposed to one where one would derive a ruling from. Or another uh, caveat that they put is that this was the cultural norm at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where men and women would not shake hands and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is abiding, is abiding by that cultural norm. Number three, the Hadith of At-Tabarani. They said if you look at the statements of the early scholars of Hadith, likes of Abu Zur'a, the likes of Abu Hatim al-Razi and other than them, they said that this Hadith is inauthentic because it is only, well, for multiple reasons, they're in the chain of narration, but the fact that it is only found in a tabarani and in not in any of the major collections of Hadith, like Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawud, and Nasai, or Ibn Majah, this is an indication within of itself. Those say, so they say in such a situation, the ruling would be the following. Number one, is that it is not something that the Muslims should initiate themselves. So if something is initiated on their behalf and they respond to it, that may be permissible. Emphasis on the word may be permissible. Number two, they said that this is something that should not be repeated. So for example, it's just a one-off thing, a one-time thing that is happening and something that will not be repeated. They said that if it is meant to be repeated, then the Muslim is required to clarify their stance on how they deal with the opposite gender, one with respect and one with nobility, where they will not physically engage with the opposite gender in that fashion. Number three is that there should be some sort of consequence in not doing this action. So what does that look like? That consequence which is presumed, they stated that it is feared that one may not get the job that they're applying for if this is in the initial job interview. Or number two, that it may cause them to get fired in some sort of situation, whatever that may be. Or number three, that there's a high level of offense that may be caused that would make this individual look bad in their workplace, that would make them look bad in their workplace. And then number four, they said that there should be no desire involved towards this individual. There should be no desire involved in this individual that they are engaging in this handshake in. So this is the other side of the spectrum. And it's very important to understand both sides of these spectrums. Now, I'm not imposing one view upon another. I'm not saying that this view is better than the other, or one should only follow this view, or should only follow this view. But what I'm trying to show over here is the accommodation of the Sharia in those situations that are very difficult. Because often what we'll find is that if a Muslim is not prepared in those situations, they actually end up acting very awkward. So you'll end up seeing that Muslims end up lying. Oh, there's something on my hand and therefore I cannot shake your hand. Or they'll end up sneezing on their hand or doing something even more foul like picking their nose or something like that. 
and then trying to put their hand on the other person is like, oh, I don't want to shake your hand at that time. And that's even more offensive and vulgar. So in this situation, I want to show the vastness of the Sharia in these matters. Show the vastness of the Sharia in these matters and also show the strict conditions that the Sharia puts. So it's not a free-for-all that you can do this at any time like um, certain progressive and liberal movements will understand. But rather there's a limit to it that it should not be self-initiated. It should not be something that is ongoing. There should be some sort of offense or consequence or repercussion uh, involved. And then there should be no level of desire towards the person that this is happening with. There should be no level of desire that uh, this is happening with. Now, the last thing I would like to speak about um, in dealing with the opposite gender is where is the fine line between being congenial and nice to your colleagues versus being straight to the point and limiting the contact uh, uh, you know, altogether. So the Muslim in general is meant to be a cheerful person. We're meant to be happy people that are engaging with people that wish the best for people. That is the general rule. So even smiling in the face of people is considered an act of sadaqah. Now, in an environment where you are working with men and women, Muslim and non-Muslim, where is that fine line? The Sharia mandates over here, it a lot of it will come down to your intention. If your intention is general and is inclusive of everyone, where you want to treat everyone nicely and fairly, then the Sharia will actually reward this. However, if you become intentionally funny and you start joking around for the sake of flirting, or for the sake of uh, you know, engaging with the opposite gender with no noble intention behind it, then the Sharia would actually consider this impermissible. The Sharia would consider this impermissible. So in the terms of engaging with your non-Muslim colleagues, you should treat them like you treat anyone else. Be nice to them, be courteous to them, be helpful to them. But as soon as you find that your intention is in changing, where you're trying to please the opposite gender for the sake of getting their intention, or if you're trying to you know, win their heart over and trying to flirt with them. Or you find yourself that you're being extra kind and extra nice to a particular person at work and you're not spreading your, your love everywhere else. Then those are areas where you need to be very cautious of and be very cognizant of your actions. And recognize that your intention is changing and that you potentially could be sinful for those matters. You potentially could be sinful for those matters. I will move on to scenario number three, in dealing with work meetings, in dealing with work meetings. So number one, what we will look at under this category is the locations that you are meeting at. And the Sharia considers all places to be permissible until proven otherwise, until proven otherwise. And what the Sharia will say over here is, even if you're going to do something halal in an impermissible place, that action within of itself can become haram. So what we look at is a differentiation between مَكَانُ الْمَعْصِيَةِ وَمَكَانُ يَقَعَ فِيهِ الْمَعْصِيَةِ That a place that is of inherent sin versus a place where sin can take place. What are examples of these two? So nowadays when you go to a restaurant, you will find that most restaurants will serve alcohol. Most restaurants will serve alcohol. So there are permissible establishments where sin is taking place, thus being the sin of alcohol. And we're not talking about alcohol coming to your table or anything like that. We're just talking about the presence of alcohol at those very restaurants. So this is considered makan taqafihi al masiya. This is a permissible place where sin is taking place. Then what is an example of a sinful place? Makan al masiya is considered those places that is inherently created for sin. So this will be something like a bar, something like a club. Those places are inherently built for sin and there is no permissible um, you know, intention behind building those places. So what the Sharia will say in this sort of situations, that in the place of inherent sin, like the bar, like the club, even if you're going there to do something permissible, like drink water, like to go for a meeting, it would become impermissible for you to go there because it is makan al masiya because it is a place of inherent sin. Whereas, to go to a restaurant where alcohol is being sold, it would become permissible for you as long as you are not engaged in that sin. As long as you are not engaged in that sin. But let us explain what that looks like. 
engaged in that sin, meaning that number one, you're not drinking that alcohol yourself, nor is it increasing your temptation to drink that alcohol. And then number two, that alcohol is not being drunk at your table. Alcohol is not being drunk at your table. So this is how the Sharia will differentiate between two different types of places and the ruling on those places. So now, in terms of alcohol being brought to your table, if you work with a lot of non-Muslim colleagues, it is very important for you to have a discussion with your manager and your colleagues at work. And you will notice that this is something that a lot of people are very understanding of. Not for the religious reasons that we have, but for the reasons of sobriety. Where if someone was an alcoholic and they have left their alcoholism to become sober. So in that situation, they will be very accommodating to that situation. So in these sort of situations, you have a conversation with your boss and your colleagues and tell them straight up that, look, according to my religious values and ethics, I do not believe in alcohol being a good thing. And I would greatly appreciate that if you would like my presence at the meeting, then please do not consume any alcohol on the table that I'm going to be at. And you'll find in such situations that they will be very, very accommodating and understanding. What becomes really, really awkward is that when you don't have these conversations, you end up going to a restaurant, people are drinking, and then your fitrah kicks in. And you're like, you have to get out, you have to get out, you have to get out. And then all of a sudden, again, you will resort to awkward behavior, maybe such as lying, that, oh, an emergency came up and I need to leave. Or you're going to be socially awkward and they're like, who is this weirdo? Why is he behaving so strange? All of that can be avoided just by having a simple conversation. All of that can be avoided by having a simple conversation. Um, the last point I will discuss, just because my, my time is coming to an end, is the issue of Salah. The issue of Salah. So for Salatul Jum'ah, this question was raised that there's difficulty in praying Salatul Jum'ah at work. It is your constitutional right to be able to pray Salatul Jum'ah. Your workplace cannot prevent you from praying Salatul Jum'ah as long as you're making up the time that is missed. So what that means is, if you miss one hour extra of work for Jum'ah, you have to make it up another time. What ends up happening though, is Muslims end up trying to abuse the system. So Jum'ah will require, let's just say an hour and a half, right? You need about half an hour to 45 minutes for the Jum'ah, commuting back and forth, having your lunch. Let's just say you need an hour and a half. What will some Muslims end up doing? Let's take three hours off and say it's for religious reasons. That within of itself not only is haram for you, because that's not the time that you need, but it is also harmful to other Muslims. So that the next time someone tries to come and get a concession for Jum'ah, the experience that they had the first time, oh, Muslims are abusive of their time, and therefore let's not allow this concession, or make it very, very strict, that you're only allowed an hour for Jum'ah, and that's it. So please do not abuse that privilege. You are allowed constitutionally to go and pray Jum'ah, and that is something that is allowed. Now let's move to the issue of Salahs, particularly in the winter time. You're at work for Dhuhr, Asar, and probably Maghrib, uh, depending on your work hours. Where does the Sharia accommodate in such a situation, and what concessions can be made? So number one, we have to understand that the general rule is, in the salat kanat ala al-mu'minina kitab al-mawquta. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed the prayers at their proper times, and they are required to be prayed at their proper times. The concession that the Sharia will allow is in the following situation. You will be allowed to delay your dhuhr till close to the ending time of dhuhr. And then pray your asr at the very beginning time of asr. And therefore in one break, you're able to pray two salahs. This is in the regular circumstance and situation where you are at work. And it is difficult to get two breaks, one for dhuhr, one for asr. If you're only able to get one break, then the Sharia would accommodate that you delay the hotel till the end, pray Asr at the very beginning, you pray both of their Salahs in their respective time, there is no sin involved, and even the Kiraha of delaying your Salah will be uplifted due to the necessity that your work has brought. Some Muslims are of the misconception that you're allowed to combine your prayers at the end of the day when you go home. This is not true. The Sharia is not, it does not accommodate in that fashion. As we established in our principles, the Sharia will accommodate due to the degree, due, uh, in accordance to the level of the hardship. So, in such a situation where you have the ability to pray Dhuhr at its end, Asr at its beginning, that is the preferred thing to do if you're not able to get two separate breaks for Dhuhr and for Asr. Now, what do you do in that one off situation? 
Now, let's just say you're driving for a business meeting and you know that you're not going to get an opportunity to pray Asr at its beginning time. In that one-off situation, I will emphasize this again, one-off situation, meaning very rare, the Sharia will actually allow you to combine your prayers fully, Dhuhr as for and Asr as for being combined either in the time of Dhuhr or either in the time of Asr. What is the proof for this? The proof for this is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhum and Sahih Muslim where he says that the Prophet وسلم, combined his prayers not out of traveling, not out of fear, and not out of rain. He was asked, why did the Prophet وسلم, do this? He said to make things easy for his ummah, to make things easy for his ummah. So as a one-off situation where you are required to combine your prayers and not shorten, the Sharia would accommodate to that. The Sharia would accommodate to that. I have a whole different section that is left, which is on how to deal with celebrations and the end of the year uh, things like New Year's parties and Christmas parties and seasonal greetings. But my lecture ends in four minutes and I want to leave some time for engagement, inshallah. So we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tawfiq to continue this perhaps at uh, a later time. Wallahu ta'ala alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbi wa sallam. I'm open to your questions and feedback after I make this one simple statement. And that simple statement is things that happen by accident or beyond your control, the Sharia will overlook. In those situations that are in your control and you're able to research, always go and speak to your local Imam and Sheikh to get clarification and do not make judgments by yourself. Always speak to your local Imam and Sheikh for clarification and do not make judgments for yourself. That is the last thing I want to say before I open up the floor for comments and questions. Jazakum Allah khair. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. What is the ruling on that situation? Excellent question. So one thing we need to understand is that when we ask a question for clarification, we have a principle in the Sharia that states, al ala shay far'un an tasawwarihi, that a ruling upon a particular matter is directly related to the picture that is portrayed about that matter. So the more details that we give, the more detailed of an answer can be given that is appropriate to the situation. So I will give some general guidelines, but I would suggest in your situation, the best thing to do is schedule an appointment with an imam and a sheikh. Give him the full picture of your situation, the type of job that you're doing, are you able to change jobs and find other jobs, etc., etc., and then get a proper answer. But as a general guideline over here, I would say number one is that Juma is mandatory and it has to be prayed. The Prophet ﷺ makes it very clear what happens when you miss three Jumas in a row, when you're able to pray Juma. So in this sort of situation, if you are able to get another job, that is what the Sharia would require. Number two, in this sort of situation, if you know your routes, as you're in the situation where you're not able to get another job, and you know your routes, they're like repeated routes, spend as much time researching as you can, and then in that situation, try to find a time uh, and a place where it is on your route, where they pray Juma at that time. And you'll notice that across the city, you'll have Jumas in a wide variety of spectrum those that perform the Juma Salah according to the Hanbali Madhab. So they pray even before the time of Dhuhr. They pray at like 11.30, 12 o'clock before the time of Dhuhr even kicks in. And then you also have those that follow the Hanafi Madhab where they pray uh, Asr very later than the, the Shafi Madhab. So therefore they will delay Juma at that time as well. So maybe around like 2.30, 3 o'clock, they're still praying Juma. So you can find, try to figure out uh, in that situation. So they were, that's where the, the Sharia would make concessions. But to permanently allow the missing of Juma, the Sharia would not allow that unless it's a, a very dire situation. But again, in your situation particularly, 
May Allah make it easy for you. Schedule an appointment with your local Imam and Shaykh and explain your situation in full and they'll find a way out for you, inshaAllah. Wallahu alam. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, go ahead. Can women pray in the presence of men at the workplace? And the answer to that is if you look at the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the men used to pray in the front, the women used to pray in the back, and there was no barrier. In fact, we see even uh, extraordinary circumstances where some of the men couldn't afford underwear. So their private parts would become exposed in the salah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told the women folk, go down into sajda early and delay in getting up when the Imam makes the takbir so that you will not be exposed to the private parts of the men. And that shows what close proximity they ended up being in where the woman would actually be able to see that. So that is showing that it is permissible. But now what we want to try to avoid is women being objectified, where men are staring at women. That's what we want to try to avoid. So if a woman is in the workplace, she should try to find an isolated room to pray in. That is the best thing to do. In the situation where she's tried to find an isolated room, she's unable to find it and there's no other place that she can find and time is running out, then she prays wherever she is and there's no sin upon her in terms of what happens and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Go ahead. Yes. Excellent. So what the Sharia, so the brother's question is, uh, imagine you have a musalla and a brother wants to enter the room, but the sister is the only one in that room and she is currently praying. The time for Asr is about to start and you haven't prayed Dhuhr yet. What should you do in that situation? So going back to the principles we established, we would want to see what the ruling of Khalwa actually fall into this. So number one, is this an easily accessible place where people can easily come and out of? And the answer is, generally speaking, yes. That the doors remain open. As long as you don't have a bad intention and as long as you're not locking the door, then it remains easily accessible. Therefore, khalwa would not apply. The last thing I would mention over here as a caveat, again, looking at your own intention. It's very easy for our intentions to change in the presence of the opposite gender. As long as that's not something that you would fear, then inshallah, it's not a problem. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. My time has come to an end. I've actually gone two minutes over my time. I apologize, Sheikh Abdul Munim, if he is here. Please forgive me, inshallah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I pray this was beneficial for you. Again, uh, any mistakes that I've made are for myself and from shaitan. Anything that is correct and all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I'm willing to engage with anyone that has any questions uh, later on, inshallah. I pray that you found it beneficial and you saw the vastness of the sharia in terms of accommodating to situations. And last but not least, I will repeat again, in those situations that happen by accident, the Sharia overlooks. In those situations, we're able to research and learn. Always speak to your local Imam and Sheikh for clarification first. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Jazakum Allah for your attention and hosting me at this wonderful conference. <clears throat> and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unites us again in a better location, in a better situation, and in a better circumstance. Allahumma ameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. I will be leaving to the uh, airport at 6.30 inshallah. So till we meet again, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.